Hey, welcome to Real Estate Resource. Thanks for stopping by. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I really hope you enjoy this video. All right, so last week we started with the amendments, the addenda, the advisories, the, the, the ancillary forms that, you know, some of the ancillary forms that you guys are using on a regular basis. Uh, today we're going to go through um, another set of them, hopefully kind of get through the rest of them. And it's the ones that you guys are using or should be using more often than anything else. There's, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of them, but those are going to be kind of on a by use basis and it's not something that you're going to run across a lot. So we're really focusing on the most common forms that you guys are going to be using on an everyday basis. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and let's start here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You guys should be looking at right now the short sale information advisory. And it is exactly what it says it is. It is the short sale information and advisory. And what this does is when I'm taking a short sale listing, I want to include this into my listing present, you know, my listing contract with my seller. And what it really does is it just talks about what a short sale is, what the alternatives are to short sale, like a loan mod, foreclosure, deed in lieu of foreclosure, declaring bankruptcy. These are the options. It goes through that. It tells the seller that the lender has to agree to the short sale, that it's not a given, that there's still some liability on the debt for the seller. And we're not going to read everything on this, but this is like it said, it's an information advisory. So there's nothing for you to fill out, but what it is, is the information for the seller so they understand what happens to them through the process of a short sale or if they go through foreclosure what the what the what the rules are for one to four unit properties because remember this is only for one to four unit properties it talks about each of those things that happen the liens the trustee sales the junior liens the 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 the, the, the liens that are in first position all of those things and what the consequences are for your taxes for your credit um, it has a little disclaimer there for professional advice about you going, your seller going and talking to an attorney or a CPA, which I advise all of you guys to do. I think one of the things that we do as agents sometimes is we make assumptions on how things are going to work. And, and, and those assumptions sometimes get us into some issues, right? And so we assume that for the majority of the people that are going to do a short sale, it's because, well, they bought their house. They, they owe more than it's worth, and the bank, because they don't want to foreclose, is probably going to allow them to do a short sale. Okay, but we don't really know what all the tax consequences may or may not be for that seller, and sometimes we don't ask the right questions about those tax implications or the, or the, or the, the um, you know, legal and financial issues that could face the seller doing a short sale. So remember, when it comes to anything to do with taxes, whether it be a short sale or regular sale, whatever it is, if you have any question about whether or not there's going to be some kind of tax consequence or burden on your seller, your first advice is you must go see a CPA. And if it's somebody that you have to refer to to go see a CPA, after that conversation, follow up with an email that says, hey, just a reminder, we spoke earlier today. And I need you to go see a CPA to make sure that you're clear on what the tax consequences or burdens may be for the sale of this property. Because we, again, make assumptions. So not just in short sales where there may be some kind of tax liability or consequence. There is also in the regular sale of somebody's principal residence. Yes, a principal resident, their seller, they sell their property, $250 exemption for for a single person, $500,000 exemption for a married couple. That exemption exists, but when we sell a property, you don't know how many times I've talked to an agent where they'll say to me, oh, don't worry, the seller's only netting X. It's not about net. I could have bought my house 30 years ago for $100,000. And now, here I am in 2023, 
and I'm selling it for seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. Now I've refied it, I've taken out home equity lines, I've got I borrowed against my home's equity because I've had so much of it for so many years. Now I owe four or five hundred thousand dollars because I've taken so much out on it, and I'm still gonna net three hundred thousand. That's great. But my tax liability isn't based on the net, it's based on my tax basis, which is the amount I purchased the home for. So I, I, my fear is when you guys are out there in these listing appointments with people who have owned their house for many, many, many years, you're just going off the assumption of, well, it's your principal residence, you're not gonna have a tax liability, and that's dangerous. So kind of understand that the, when people have owned their house for a long time, you have to ask that question for a principal residence. And now we're not talking about a short sale, we're talking about a regular sale. In a short sale here, we have to ask questions about because there is tax implications on, on home equity lines of credit and, and any refis that have been done, the only thing that's protected in a short sale is that original purchase money, right? You're still gonna get a 1099, and that's what it says here about taxes. You're still gonna get a 1099 from your lender and the 1099 they're going to give you is for the forgiven debt because that forgiven debt is income to the seller and so they're going to get that but if it's purchase money generally they're not going to get taxed on that even though they have to report it that purchase money they're normally not going to get taxed on but if they've done refis they may get taxed on that forgiven debt because that's income to them and that's why it's super important that when you're doing a short sale even if your belief is on the short sale that they're not going to have a tax problem that they're not going to have any issues you got to tell them you're going to get a 1099 and i need you to go see your cpa and make sure it's a cpa and not a tax preparer nothing against those tax preparing companies that that's what they do is they just put together your 1040 EZ for you and send it in. But a CPA, somebody who knows the true tax laws, ways that they need to report income, how they can, how they can uh, you know, maybe alleviate some of that, that burden from the taxes. So everybody in a short sale, you should be advising them to go see a CPA just to make sure because we don't know. We're not tax professionals. We don't know the laws as far as taxes go. We've got to make sure that we're giving them the right advice. You don't take that on because when they do have a tax burden based on it and you told them, oh, don't worry, it's a short sale. You're fine. You didn't make any money. And they have to pay a tax bill the following year when they file, they're going to come back and they're going to look for you. And they're going to say, you told me. And that's not something that we want to deal with. Okay. Uh, Liliana put in the chat, is this part of the listing package or can it be used for the buyer also? I mean, you could give this to a buyer if you wanted to, just so they understand the process of, of a short sale. You don't need to. This is really more for the listing package. So if I'm taking a listing um, that's going to be a short sale, this, ha this needs to be in my, in my listing package, my contracts that are signed by the seller. So again, this is just showing whose role, whose authority, you know, right? It just is like it is. Information advisory. Here you go, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. This is how it works. That's why it has the buyer. You can have the buyer sign it when you, if they don't submit it with their purchase agreement, you can send it to them, okay? The really the most important thing for the buyer is gonna be the next one that we're gonna look at, which is the short sale addendum, okay? This has to be included with your offers on a short sale. So when you know you're writing an offer on a short sale, you've gotta put this in because it changes the terms of the RPA to allow for the time necessary to get that approval of the short sale. All right, so short sale addendum, this is an addendum to the purchase agreement. Generally, that's gonna be 99% of the time, it's gonna be an addendum to the purchase agreement because you're incorporating it with your purchase agreement. The only time that it would be part of the counter offer is if you as the listing agent received an offer on your short sale that didn't include a short sale addendum and you were then including that addendum back with your counter offer for the buyer to agree to. That's it. So we got what the agreement is, the date of that agreement. Remember, that's the date of the purchase agreement with the date it was created or the date the counter offer was created. That's what's going to go here. Okay. So we go down here to the short sale approval. We have the property, right? The address, the buyer, the seller, the short sale approval. This agreement is contingent upon seller's receipt of and delivery to buyer of a seller approved written consent, short sale lender's consent to the agreement from all existing secured lenders and lien holders, short sale lenders, by 5 p.m. no later than 45 days after acceptance. That's the default is 45 days. Now remember, it says all of them. 
So you might get an approval from your first trust deed, but you may have additional lien holders that you also have to get the approval from in that 45 day period, okay? What that does now is it makes this a contingency of this agreement is that it's contingent upon you receiving the approval of all of the lenders. Now, if I don't get that by day 45, there's two things that could happen. The seller could say, it's day 45, I haven't gotten the approval, we're gonna cancel using the short sale approval contingency and that's it, the deal's canceled. The seller could do that. Or the buyer could say, I'm gonna send a notice to perform to the seller, you didn't get it, we're gonna cancel because you didn't get the, uh, the approval. That's it. If buyer or seller cancels the agreement prior to the short sale contingency date, that party may be in breach of the agreement unless the cancellation is made pursuant to some other paragraph in this addendum or in the agreement, whether or not time periods in this agreement have commenced. Short sale lenders consent means that all short sale lenders shall collectively agree to reduce their prospective loan balances by an amount sufficient to permit the proceeds from the sale of the property to pay the existing balances on loans secured by the property real property taxes, brokerage commissions, closing costs, and other monetary obligations this agreement requires seller to pay cl at close of escrow, including but not limited to escrow charges, title charges, documentary transfer taxes, parations, retrofit costs, homeowner association fees, and repairs. Without requiring seller to place any funds into escrow or have any continuing obligation to short sell lenders approved by seller prior to delivery to buyer. So basically what it's saying is whoever is a lien holder it has to, and now, it has to be, it has to make sense. And what they're talking about when they say the loan that you used to secure the property, the first trust deed gets all their money unless the amount of the, of the liens that exists are, I mean, the, the value of the property is less than the first trust deed itself. Then what happens is the first trust deed lender, the mortgage, like we leave it at that because nobody has really has seconds anymore unless they're, after the fact, right? Purchase money is the, is, the, is the mortgage. So the purchase money has to get paid. So if the purchase money, if the, let's say the purchase money loan is 500,000, now the house is worth 450, plus they owe, you know, $10,000 to a, a home equity line or some other thing that they borrowed against the house, or they have a lien for some reason of five or ten thousand dollars right so the house is worth 450 they owe 500 to the mortgage they owe twenty thousand dollars to other lien holders judgments whatever it is so that's five hundred and twenty thousand dollars that they owe on top of the value of the 450 what's going to happen is the mortgage the first the first trust deed lender is going to look at everything and they're going to say well look we want all 450 of it or they may say, as long as we can get 425, we're good, which means that, okay, well, that means I have another 25,000. I can approve those other loans and pay it. But that doesn't necessarily always work that way. So sometimes what, what screws up short sales is not the mortgage, right? Not the first trust deed holder, because they understand they, they, things go less than what they are. They don't want to have all those holding costs and the, the, the problems of, 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 um, foreclosing and, and taking on the property as part of their REO um, portfolio. It's the smaller lien holders that become the issue that usually are the ones that kill short sales and stop them from happening. But I gotta have, you have to have everything approved, okay? Seller shall deliver buyer a copy of short sale lender's consent or term sheet within three days after receipt and approval by seller. Seller's presentation to buyer of short sales lender consent satisfying 1B removes the contingency 1A. Right, so if I give you the consent letter, the information from the lenders that says, yeah, we're good with the price, then it, rem it automatically removes that contingency. If by the short sale contingency date, seller has not received short sale lenders consent satisfying 1B, seller may in writing cancel the agreement or buyer has not received a copy of short sale lenders consent satisfying 1B, buyer may cancel the agreement in writing. In either case, buyer shall be entitled to return of any remaining deposit delivered to escrow. We're gonna to get to that in a minute about the deposit because for the majority of you in a short sale, your buyer's deposit's not gonna be in until you get this approval. Uh, seller shall reasonably cooperate with existing short sale lenders in the short sale process, but neither seller nor buyer is obligated to change the terms of their agreement to satisfy short sale lender's consent or term sheet, which means I offer you the 450 that the property is worth and the short sale lender says, look, if you guys could 
if you guys could give me X amount or raise the sales price to this amount, you don't have to. You're not required to do that to get the consent. All we're looking for is consent on the terms that were already agreed upon. If short sale lenders written consent or term sheets provided to seller require changes to the agreement in order to satisfy the terms of 1B, neither buyer nor seller shall be obligated to continue negotiations to satisfy any of the requirements of the term sheet. Either party may cancel writing, uh, in writing, cancel the agreement, and sellers advised to seek legal accounting and tax advice before agreeing to any such changes. Both parties must agree in writing to changes to the written consent of the term sheet before continuing under the terms of the agreement. If the agreement is canceled pursuant to this paragraph, buyers shall be entitled to return of any remaining deposits delivered to escrow. So that's it, right? If they ask you to agree to it and you don't, you can cancel either party. All right, time periods. Time periods in this agreement for inspections, contingencies, covenants, and other obligations shall begin the day after seller delivers to buyer short sale lenders consent, satisfying 1B and 1F, right? So you get the approval from the short sale lenders. Now the time periods start, right? So if we wrote the offer 30 days ago, right? We wrote it on November 14th and we get the approval today. Tomorrow, my time period for inspections, my time period for appraisal, all of that stuff, my time period as a seller for me to deliver all the disclosures, all that stuff starts tomorrow. Not, it didn't start when we got the offer accepted 30 days ago. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, you can make it that if you want that all the time period started way back when, but why? Why until there's an approval would you do that, right? The same here with the buyer's deposit check, it is a day after their time periods for the, the deposit, right? So three business days after we get the consent. So if today we got the consent, I'd have until Monday, well, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, I'd have till Tuesday as a buyer on the short sale to get my money into escrow, okay? The next section, no assurance of lender approval. Again, we understand that there is no guarantee that the lender is gonna approve the short sale. They may or may not. Buyer and seller's cost. Parties acknowledge that each of them may incur costs in connection with rights or obligations under the agreement. These costs may include, but are not limited to, payments for loan applications, inspections, appraisals, and other reports. Such costs will be the sole responsibility of the party incurring them. If short sale lenders do not consent to the transaction or either party cancels the tra transaction pursuant to the agreement, right? So just like any other sale, that's the thing is, I think what happens is sometimes buyers and even the buyer's agents think, well, why am I going to pay for an appraisal right now? Why am I going to pay for a home inspection right now? What happens if it doesn't get approved or whatever the case is? It's the same as any sale. If I go and buy a regular house today with a 30 day escrow and I have seven to 10 or 17 days to do my inspections and I do my inspection and I do my appraisal and it appraises and for some other reason it cancels, right? Whether the seller had a contingency or I canceled it for some reason as buyer because I still had a contingency in place. I still had to pay for the appraisal and I still had to pay for the inspection. No one's paying me back for that. But the problem that we have as agents is that we, and when we're doing our buyer's inspect or our buyer um, consultation, when we're prepping our buyers for, hey, we're gonna go showing and this is what the process of selling a house looks like or buying a house looks like. And these are the forms that you're gonna use and this is how we're gonna write an offer. We don't explain to them that part of the cost of purchasing a home is you're gonna pay for a home inspection and maybe some other inspections that may be required based on the information in the home inspection. You're also gonna pay for an appraisal. And if the transaction doesn't close, whether it be our fault or theirs, it is not a cost that you're going to recoup. So you've got to be prepared and you've got to tell people. And the reason we don't do that, we don't tell buyers when we're a buyer's agent, we don't tell them that they may spend a thousand dollars and not get the money back is because we're afraid that that's going to stop them from wanting to buy. So instead we hide that fact from them. And then we have to deal with the consequences of them spending the thousand dollars and then not getting their dream home, which is a worse, a much worse conversation. So, you've got to understand like like part of the pre-qualifying a buyer is to find out if they've got the nerves to actually purchase a home because if they're going to run away if they're scared of the chance of losing the thousand dollars or investing the thousand dollars in the purchase then you're going to have other issues with them throughout the purchase of the home so you've got to make sure that you are 
that you are uh, not only preparing them for the, the, the process and, and qualifying them with the lender, but qualifying them with their ability to be a good buyer, right? We've, I've talked to you guys about this in other classes is your buyer has to be ready, willing, and able, right? Able is the lender qualifications and the cash that they have. Ready is they want to do it right now. Willing is they have to understand the entire process that goes into purchasing a home and because we've explained it to them and they're willing to work within those parameters, which means I'm willing to invest the thousand dollars even if I don't get the house. I'm willing to do, live by the advice that you gave me. I'm willing to do the things that you're advising me to do that are in my best interest. That's willing. Most of us find a buyer and we got ready and able and the willing part, we try to push them along and that's where we get frustrated with buyers. So again, off contract talk, but it's just something important for you guys to remember that that conversation has to be had, that there's a chance that you're going to invest this thousand dollars and you're still not going to get the home. Other offers. Um, the buyer's offer has been accepted, but the seller has the right to still market the property for backup offers to accept backup offers and um, subject to short sale lenders requirements present to and present to the short sale lender any accepted backup offers. And seller has to tell the buyer, by the way, we got a backup offer. You have to do it. You can't deny it. Just like in a regular sale. Let's say for example, in a regular sale, I'm the listing agent, I get an offer from one of the buyer's agents, we accept that offer. And I change the listing on the MLS to pending. That's cool which means, hey, we're in escrow, it's ready to go. I'm not even, I'm not advertising for backup offers, but I get one. I get an agent that just submits an offer to me. Doesn't call me, doesn't say, hey, can I send you a backup offer? Nothing. And even if they did and they said, can I send you a backup offer? And I say, no, and they send it, I am required to present it. Whether it becomes a backup offer or not, I'm required to present it. And it's the same thing here with the short sale. You may have submitted already to the short sale lender for them to start the process of approving the short sale, and then you get another offer that's a backup, you gotta submit it. You have to, okay? And then again, the credit, legal, and tax advice. Seller is advised to seek advice from qualified California real estate and tax attorneys, certified public accountant, or other expert regarding such potential consequences of a short sale. That's it. So that's gotta be in the buyers. That's gotta be in your offer, and if it's not, as a listing agent, you gotta counter and put it in. Okay, um, yes, and there is a delivery of short sale approval addendum. There is a form. I think we talked about it last week. If not, we, we, I'll show it, but there is. There's a form. Oh, I know when we talked about it. They updated it, so I did it in the, um, in the form update that's going to come out next week on the 18th. We talked about it there because they made some changes to it. So there is a form. If you want to know more about it, you can go back to my uh, form revisions video. It's in there for um, the forms that are coming out December 18th. Um, isn't there an expiration date on the short sale approval from the lender? Yeah, right here, 45 days. That's the default. You can change it to anything else, but 45 days is the default, meaning that in that 45 days, if the lender doesn't approve it, that's it. So 45 days, that's your time period. Or you can add more, say you want more time. Okay, we want 60 days. You can change that right here, that's fine. You can change that. I'm going to give you 60 days to get the approval, but the default is 45. All right. Any questions about any other questions about the short sale addendum? Uh, let's see. Bertha, on a regular sale, if I'm required to present a backup offer to seller and now he wants to go with this new offer, what is the conversation with the seller about legal consequences? Okay. So fair point, because that is probably going to happen. I am legally prepared, uh, required to present that offer. And the seller says, well, we want that one. I'm sorry, Mr. Seller, we can't go with that one. This is gonna, if you want to entertain this one, it has to be as a backup offer in case the current offer that we are in uh, escrow with cancels, but we can't accept this one. I'm sorry, it wasn't a bet that we didn't accept the better offer, but legally we're bound to, to continue with the offer that you accepted. That's it. And then the legal consequences, if you try to cancel without having the authority to cancel, right, whether you have a contingency or some other method or or the buyer fails to perform, right? So you send a notice to buyer to perform and they don't. So you cancel based on those terms. If you do it outside of that, you just say, I'm canceling because I want to take this other offer. Then the buyer can sue the seller for specific performance, force them to sell them the house. 
and then also have to recoup any fees that it costs them to force them to do the sale. So it's not fun if the seller tries to cancel. Jesus, you had your hand up, go ahead. Yes, also on the short sales, once you, the short seller is approved, uh, you wanna make sure you get a letter from the bank stating that the full amount is forgiven and you get that letter, you give it to the seller to save it, to give it to to the CPA when they do the taxes. Yeah, yeah, but that's and that's fine. You do need yes. that, and you, and you'll get Thank that you. from the most. Time, most you'll time get that from the lender, but lender. You, you do need it. But that doesn't absolve them from the tax consequences, right? They're going to get a ten ninety nine. If if the lender says you're fully absolved of any of the of the balance, right? You get that. That's fine. Then you're going to get a 1099 for that forgiven debt. It's still going to get taxed if it's not purchase money. Okay, so you got to remember the thing is the original purchase money is the only thing in the state of California that's protected. Any financing after that, even if it is totally forgiven and I owe no balance, I still have, there's still a chance I have a tax liability. So that's why it's so important that they go and talk to a CPA. Super important. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one which is the tenant occupied property addendum for use when selling tenant occupied one to four unit properties guys this is the one i really want to make sure what i want to make sure on here is that you guys understand is that when i write an offer on a one to four unit property that means it could be a single family a condo a townhouse a mobile home four units and there's tenants in the property I have to include this form, whether it's going to be delivered vacant or it's gonna be delivered with the tenants, that doesn't matter. All we're going to do here is say that it is a tenant occupied property and here is what's happening with the tenants at the close of escrow. That's it, that's it. So the default is tenants to remain in possession, period. That's the default. The next one is property to be delivered vacant. B1, the property or units, let's say it's a four unit building and two of the units are gonna be delivered vacant, then you would write in which unit numbers were gonna be delivered vacant, okay? If seller, after exercise of good faith attempts and subject to applicable law, is unable to remove existing tenants by close of escrow or five days prior, my choice would be you guys check off five days prior on your topas, Buyer may cancel this agreement and buyer's sole remedy shall be return of deposits and buyer's reasonable out-of-pocket expenses for inspection reports and appraisal fees under the agreement. Or buyer may elect to proceed with the transaction with the tenants in possession and waives any claim for damages or compensation arising out of the tenants remaining in possession. If that's the case, you would have to do an amendment of existing agreement terms, right? A form we talked about last week, where you're now saying buyer and seller agree that se that buyer is receiving property with tenants in possession or will close escrow with tenants in possession, okay? Seller within five days prior to close of escrow shall deliver to buyer the names of all adult occupants residing in the property other than the seller that are known to seller or check the box, the following are the names of all adult occupants other than the seller that are known to the seller. So I either I can write them there, which there's really only enough room for probably one or two names in there, maybe three if you're lucky. You're probably going to have to attach a list. That's it. So five days prior to close of escrow, I'm if I cannot, I've done everything I can legally to evict the tenant. If I cannot do that by five days prior to close of escrow, the buyer gets the right to cancel. And they have the right to when they cancel because the seller agreed to the property being vacant. They have the right then to also recoup their home inspection and appraisal fees. Okay. And at the same time on that five days prior to close of escrow, the seller's required to give me a list of all of the tenants that live in the property other than the seller themselves. Okay. So default is tenants are remaining in possession. Secondary is the choice of which units or all of them are gonna be delivered vacant. And you wanna check the box that five days prior, if the seller is not gonna be able to vacate the, the units, I have the right to cancel as buyer. 
Okay. Now, remember, this is all the buyer's choice. The seller can't at five days prior to close of escrow say, I couldn't evict them. I'm canceling. Mm -mm. The buyer is the only one that makes that choice that says, I'm either going to accept it with the tenants now or I'm going to cancel and you're going to pay me. Okay. Okay. Any questions so far on the first part? Okay, good. Tenant remaining in possession. Uh, go ahead, Jesus. Now would be a great time to negotiate some type of credit. So just in case the tenants decide to stay, then uh, you don't have to cancel, but maybe get some some substantial credit. You think? Yeah, but but you got to be careful with credits. This is the this is one of the things I was I go I can't remember who I was talking. Oh, I was talking to an agent on the phone earlier this week that was talking about that uh, they about how in their past they don't request repairs they only get credits right for those repairs so they get closing cost credits and additional so yeah negotiating credits if you can get closing cost credits is great the problem is is there's always going to be a limit on the amount of closing cost credits i can get so my closing cost credit that i get for accepting those tenants in possession may not offset the losses or the or, or the uh, cost that's going to get for me to vacate the tenant because I want to live in it, for example, because that's really what you guys have to understand about these about tenants is if you're talking about two, three or four units in California. Right, that it's there has to be cause to evict the tenants. You can't evict them because you're selling it. You can only evict them legally if they agree, right? You could say, hey, I'm selling the units. Would you guys be willing to leave and I'll give you cash for keys or whatever? If they agree to it and you give them the cash for keys and they leave, you're good. If they don't, the only legal way in California for you to evict those tenants is if they breach their contract in some way. They don't pay their rent. They bring people in that weren't on the lease agreement. They, they, they run a business out of there, whatever it is. They violate their, their rental agreement, then you can evict them. You got to pay them, you know, but if they rent, if they, if they, if they violate their lease agreement, you don't have to pay them anything to move out, right? You just go through the eviction process. But the only other way I can do it is if I'm going to move in myself or a family member or a property manager, I can then evict them, but I have to pay them one month's rent and relocation. On a lease, yes, yeah, somebody put the lease agreement when you need to expire. On a lease, I can't do anything until your lease expires unless you agree to it but then i've got to compensate you basically based on the the what was left on the lease and vice versa right for a tenant leaving a lease early but we'll we'll get into that but yes leases change that we're talking about just month to month rentals right now so so my my concern for you guys is this i see so many times i have so many agents that come and tell me oh we're gonna sell these with them vacant and i said oh they're vacant right now no we're gonna vacate the tenant or the tenant says they're gonna move out man we've got to get ourselves to the point here in california and now a single family residence different story that's you can vacate a tenant uh, on the sale of a single family house it's the units that are a problem so when you're promising that these leases that these properties are going to be delivered vacant i wouldn't promise it unless one of the units that the one unit you were promising is going to be vacant was the seller themselves even if it's the seller's family member, like a kid or somebody else, right? It's a, it's a, it's one of their children. It's their sister. It's their brother. And they go, oh, they don't pay rent, but they're my family, so they live here. I would, I would still treat them as a tenant. You still have to treat them as a tenant, by the way. So, be very careful about the promises of you're going to get this vacant. I would suggest that all of you guys, when you start marketing these properties, you market them like the buyer's gonna have to take the tenant in possession of the property, okay? Um, let me see, after the lease is expired, the lease contract becomes month to month automatic lease renewal. Uh, well, it depends. It depends on what their contract says. Their lease agreement could say, right, if, if that, um, if, the, if the tenant notifies the, 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 the landlord, you know, 30 days or 60 days prior to the 
termination of the lease that they want to extend, that it, it automatically reverts to another one year lease that could be in your lease agreement. Majority of lease agreements at the end of that lease agreement, if somebody hasn't given notice to terminate the lease, whatever the terms are of it, right? 30, 60, 90 days prior to the expiration, then it reverts to a month to month rental agreement until something new is is discussed so that happens okay the tenant this is just going into the tenants deposits the rent right that it has to go to the um prorated at close of escrow and given to the new buyer the compliance stuff right the no warranty is made concerning compliance with governmental restrictions of any limiting the amount of rent that can be lawfully charged my, it's just basically covering yourself saying i'm not hey it's on you i i may or may the seller may or may not be doing what's legal but you're gonna have to when you take it over proposed changes seller shall give buyer written notice of any changes to existing leases or tenancies new agreements to lease or rent or changes to the status of the condition of the property at least seven days prior to those pr proposed changes so what your seller has to understand too is once you enter into escrow you can't change any of the rental agreements or lease agreements or do any kind of renovations to the property without first giving notice and getting approval by the, sh by the buyer. Once you enter escrow, now you gotta run everything by the buyer. So let's, for example, if I was buying the property and our tenant occupied property addendum said, I'm getting the units tenant occupied, and then you evict the tenant during that without telling me, you are in breach of the contract. You can't evict the tenant. Now, whether that's good or bad for me, that's neither here nor there. You can't do anything without first giving me a notice. You got to give me seven day notice. Hey, we're going to evict this tenant because they're not paying rent or because they violated the lease agreement. You got to tell me seven days before you start that action. And then I have five days from that notice to either tell you don't do it or yeah, go ahead and do it. Okay. This is about personal property that's being included in the sale, right? So if there's any personal property that's being used, Jesus, go ahead, you put your hand up. My apologies, I got lost there. Who do we have to notify seven days before we start the notice of eviction? Well, any changes, once you're in escrow, any changes to the lease agreements, rental agreements, the property condition, any changes, you gotta give them seven, the buyer seven days notice before you do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is just a list of any personal property that's being used as part of the rental properties and whether they're going to be included or not. Okay. Uh, the rental service agreements, we got to give them to them. Any income tax statements, if this is checked, you have to give that to them. That's up to you guys if you want to check that and ask for it. Tenant estoppel certificates. Hold on a second, Jesus. The tenant estoppel certificates, I would always say that you guys check that off when you submit this with your offer because you want to get those estoppel signed by the tenants. And what an estoppel is, for those of you guys who don't know, is it's just a confirmation of the information that was disclosed to you from the seller that the tenant is cooperating that information. That's it. Go ahead, Jesus. What happens if the agent lies about the stopples and they send stopples are not signed by the tenants and they offer close? And then in the, uh, what, what what happens? Well, I'm, why would you let it close without signed stopples if you ask for stopples? Let's say the other agent didn't do a the good job, good job, and did not I, check the stopples being signed. Well, I mean, they didn't check that the estoppel certificates were going to be included right here on on. On E3, is that what you're the saying? The stopples that were provided were not correct. Were I, get, not I get correct. it. I get it. I get it. But were they asked for here, tenant estoppel certificates? Were they required as part of the contract? Let's say they didn't. Okay. I got it. It's got to be clear because it's two different things. Okay. If we agreed from the beginning that the seller was going to provide the estoppel certificates, right? That was part of the contract that wasn't countered out and they send certificates that are not signed by the buyers, then they haven't fulfilled their portion of the agreement, and me as buyer, I shouldn't allow this, the deal to close. It's just like if I got disclosures that weren't complete or signed by the seller, would I close without them? I understand, let's say, let's say they were overlooked, they were requested, they were sent, not completed, not There's signed. Nothing, nothing you can do Which about it. No. You, you closed with them like that, nothing you can do about it. And they be sued back because they lie on the, on the rents? No. 
maybe you probably could and that would also mean that the agent would be a subject to that too because you allowed it to close without getting the the completed estoppel certificates thank you mm-hmm. guys here's the thing these are legal contracts and 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 unfortunately we treat them as if they're nothing like they're a napkin with an agreement you know like we we, we ah it's just an offer ah it's just a tenant of you know uh, uh, stopples every one of these things is a legal binding agreement that's signed and agreed to and if we don't follow the terms of it and we allow it as agents we let it slide then it's our fault if something ends up going into a lawsuit because that's our job you guys have to have the courage to put your foot down and stop a transaction we're so afraid of canceling oh my god i can't cancel because then i don't get paid you'd rather get paid and have this sort of damocles hanging over your head for the rest of your life that you're going to get sued because you let a contract go through that wasn't signed or that wasn't approved or that nobody did what they were supposed to we've got to have the courage to sometimes just put our foot down and say listen we can't close you need to give this to us you agreed to it you didn't do what you were supposed to do and if you don't do what you're going to do my buyer is going to go after you monetarily they're going to they're going to they're going to take you to court they're going to sue you civilly or they're going to force you to sell and do what you're supposed to do but I know why we don't do it is because our buyers don't have the money to hire an attorney. We just want to get a deal closed. I know we look the other way, a lot of stuff to, to get little things. Oh, it's not that big a deal. We got to get better. We got to get better, right? We have to be better at what we do. And, and, and when we get better and we're super more professional about not letting little things slide and making sure that our contracts are ironclad and, and, and are, are, are safe and we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting our clients, then we'll have less issues like these ridiculous lawsuits that NAR just lost about why agents get compensated. This is why we get compensated. We don't get compensated because you know how to knock on a door or because you're good at picking up a phone or your listing presentation is the greatest listing presentation on the planet. You get compensated because you know how to protect people and guide them through a transaction. And the better you get at this, the less issues we'll have to deal with those lawsuits. Sorry, got on a soapbox for a minute. But guys, we gotta get clear and we gotta get tough on this stuff. Okay, the tenant estoppel certificates, we know they're gonna be included. Always ask for those to be in there. This is about any permits, plans, engineering documents. This is just stuff that has to be disclosed. This is just, again, kind of reiterating what needs to be disclosed. Even though they're gonna do a, the TDS and SPQ and all that stuff and they're gonna disclose some of these things, this is just telling the sellers, hey, look, you gotta disclose this stuff to the buyer. Okay? Buyer signs, seller signs, we move on. Okay, any any other questions about uh, TOPA? Now, remember, look, th- this form, this rent cap and just cause addendum comes with it. It's nothing but a disclosure. You see here, it's the tenant and the housing providing signature. This is what I have to give as a, as a landlord, well, now called a housing provider. I have to give this to my tenants. This just cause rent. That, this is not for what's happening in the purchase agreement. This is just letting people know that there is a rent amount that you can, a cap to their increases for their rents and whether or not the property is um, exempt from or subject to that rent cap. So I have to give that to my tenants. Yes, Jesus. When you give them a lease, it automatically adds it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is added to that TOPA, but you don't need to have it signed by the tenants and the seller as part of our transaction as the buyer. It's more treated as an, uh, as an advisory, okay? So don't worry about it not being signed in your transaction. Worry about having one signed when you're the housing provider, okay? All right. Any other questions on TOPA before I move on? All right. Let's move on. Residential units purchase addendum. So I've been noticing that for our office, we've had a higher number than usual and or that I've noticed in the past of mixed use properties, right? I don't know about you guys, are you dealing with a lot of mixed use out there? There's just, I've seen more and more mixed use um, deals. That's what this is for. The residential units purchase addendum is for a mixed use commercial and residential, right? So like, for example, I have a mixed use that's a, a, you know, two retail stores in front and above it is an apartment. I would write it on a commercial purchase agreement, but I would include this purchase addendum 
about just the the residential units. So it's going to ask here. So for a description, the number of commercial units. Okay, there's two. Number of residential units. There's two. And then my description of what the residential units are. Right. Uh, two bedroom, one bath, uh, you know, apartment upstairs and a one bedroom, one bath, uh, ADU downstairs, whatever it is, right? Except as specified in 2B, the number of residential units currently occupied by tenants shall be delivered subject to tenant rights upon notice of recordation on close of escrow. Currently tenant occupied residential units to be delivered vacant, right? If they're going to be vacant. The vacant units shall be delivered vacant upon recordation. We know that. Seller-occupied residential units, right? Say the seller lives in one of them, just like with our purchase agreement. We're going to put in there when they're going to move out, when they're going to be delivered, what items are included or excluded in those residential, <coughs> excuse me, properties. As additional, a oh, uh, seller shall deliver title to the pro personal property by bill of sale, which I've told you guys in the past, whenever you're selling personal property in, in a in a real estate sale, there should be a bill of sale separate for that personal item. If it's if it's over and above the expected items, right? Like if it's if it's beyond a, a stove and a refrigerator, it's you know, it starts to be furniture and things like that. You should be doing a bill of sale for those, not including them in the purchase agreement. Um what are we having a class about pricing mixed use? Uh, good question. Uh, guys, look, for commercial stuff, I, I wish I could say I was as good with commercial as I am with residential. I don't know. Uh, let me do some research on how we're pricing mixed use, and I'll get back to you on when we're going to do a class on that. Um, as additional security for any note in favor of sale for any part of the purchase price, buyer shall execute a UCC1 financing statement to be filed with the Secretary of State covering the personal property included in the purchase replacement. We're not doing that, right? We're not doing personal property that's included in the sale. We're doing it outside on a bill of sale. Uh, additional allocation of costs. Buyer or seller both with, or both will pay for the home warranty and what that price of that plan is. Uh, buyer shall choose the home warranty plan, right? It gives that already default who's paying for it and who's gonna choose it. Uh, if buyer waives, the home warranty plan and for a buyer may still purchase a home warranty plan at buyer's expense prior to close of escrow. Okay, right? So if they're waiving it, you don't check off anything here. The residential tenancy related disclosures, all paragraphs in this agreement addressing tenancy related disclosures, changes during escrow and security deposits apply with equal force and effect to residential units on the property, right? So it's just saying that all the disclosures have to be done like with that residential, just like any other residential, right? Residential one to four unit properties. You need the lead disclosure, the TDAs, TDS, NHD, and any other of the supplement disclosures, and they're listed in here, uh, what may be required. Here's all of them there. The home firing, home fire hardening disclosure and advisor, we know about that. The defensible space disclosure addendum, we've talked about that in the past. The Megan's Law disclosure, right? So anything that I would do for a normal residential, it's just referencing here to make sure it's incorporated. So if you have a mixed use, it's a commercial purchase agreement with this incorporated. So if you have a mixed use as a listing and you get an offer which is only on commercial or if it's on a residential for some reason or residential income, you got to get in contact with the buyer and say, no, what I need you to do is submit a commercial purchase agreement with the residential units addendum. Okay. All right. Questions on that, on the residential units purchase addendum. Any questions? All right, cool. All right. Let's do two quick ones here. So this is the seller intent to exchange addendum. This needs to be incorporated into your offers when you're doing a when you're doing a uh, tax deferred exchange, a 1031 exchange for your seller. You've got to incorporate this. So it has some terms in here for what happens if you can't do the the exchange, right? If you can't find an exchange property, you can extend the close of escrow, you can cancel, or you can come up with other kind of term. Um, it's an indemnity here for the seller to make sure that, hey, we're not blaming any, we're not gonna hold you res fiscally responsible buyer or agent if I cannot find, um, if I can't find uh, an exchange and I end up with a uh, tax liability, okay? So that's what this is. It just needs to be included. It's the intent to exchange. That goes back to the buyer. The buyer signs it, okay? And 
vice versa, if a buyer is buying a property from an exchange, they're going to include the buyer's intent to exchange addendum, which again, does the same thing. What happens if we can't close the exchange? Okay. So those need to be incorporated. And we've had, you know, in the past, we've had uh, classes where, um, you know, Phil Atwan, our 1031 exchange um, expert that we've had on, he's explained these and gone through them and their importance. Yes, Jesus, go ahead. Would we use this addendums as well for a reverse 1031 exchange? Yeah, any exchange, yes. This is just for any exchange. It's not specific to that one exchange. It's for any exchange, tax exchange. Okay, extension of time addendum. Again, I just want you guys to be aware. Remember uh, last week I, I talked about it is that there are specific things for specific uh, reasons, right? Like if I need an extension of time, I'm not gonna write it on an addendum, like a blank addendum. I've seen it where agents say, oh, you know, buyer and seller agreed to extend close of escrow to, and they do it on an addendum. There's a form for it, extension of time amendment. They changed it. it. used to be extension of time addendum. They've now changed it to extension of time amendment because it isn't an addendum. It's not an add to, it's a change of the purchase agreement. So it just gives us time for extension of close of escrow, extension of our contingencies, other extensions, the time for whatever we've had, whatever we may have negotiated other time periods in. That's what we're gonna do. This has an expiration they added that to the extension of time amendment is that it expires. So if I send you an extension of time amendment and you don't approve it, right? You don't return it back, it expires, which means we'd have to do a new one. So it's not just floating around there forever, okay? Questions about extension of time addendum. Again, we don't need to jump into that, but it's just, I want you guys to be aware of what it looks like. Make sure you're using it. Don't use other forms when there's a form specific to that task. All right. Uh, the probate listing addendum. Uh, again, quick one. The probate listing addendum is just going to tell whether or not this listing is a conservatorship or guardianship or receivership instead of a probate. If there's a court confirmation required or may be required, information about the listing will be or won't be in the MLS. It's just specific to probates when you have those probate listings and you have them signed. So make sure you're including this probate listing addendum and advisory to your listing agreements. Okay. And finally, the last one I want to talk about today is not an addendum or an amendment. It's an agreement, but it's an ancillary form that I don't think that we've, I don't, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I have never seen one of our agents use this or seen an agent use it, not one of our, I shouldn't say, an agent use it, I'm sure that they do. So for those of you, which is probably the majority of us that are on the class live today and probably a hell of a lot of you that are gonna watch it on YouTube later, we speak two languages, right? You, you guys speak either, you know, you speak Spanish and English or, you know, some people speak, you know, Chinese or, or well, I shouldn't say, say Chinese, I should say Mandarin or, or Cantonese. And what we do is when we work with those clients that speak those other languages that we speak is we do our presentation in that language. And the contract, unfortunately, for those people is in English. And if those people can't read or understand English, you know, in, in a way that, make, that, that they would be able to understand what's happening, what happens is, is that, that, that it's too easy to cast doubt on the representation that they're getting, right? Because if I do a presentation to someone in Spanish and I tell them the truth, everything that's in that English language contract, I tell them the truth. That's what's in here and they sign it. And then we have some kind of dispute after the fact. They can always say, well, they told me in Spanish it said X and now uh, someone told me in English it says Y. And now I can't prove otherwise because they can't read English. So now it becomes my word against their word. And so I'm not saying that you can't do your presentations in their native language, even though the contract is in English, but what we have to do is we have to now interject a third person that is brought to us by the seller. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be anybody they want, as long as that person is over 18 and they are fluent in both their language and English which means they can read it, write it, understand it, speak it, 
they need to be fluent in it. And what happens is now what you, do, you have there as their interpreter translator is they just sit in the room. I, you do your presentation in your seller's native language and that person just verifies that the information that's in the purchase agreement or in the listing agreement is the same as what I explained to you in your native language. They're just verifying it there. It's a third party brought by them to verify that what I'm telling you in, in Spanish is what's in the contract in English. Okay? So here's the identification, who they are. Declare I have been appointed by the principal, which is the seller or the buyer, for the purpose of providing interpretation and translation services relating to the principal's real estate activity described below. Principal is a buyer, seller, or housing provider, tenant, or other. Um, in no, if known, the real property is identified as, if we already know a property that we're writing an offer on or, 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 or listing, the real estate broker representing principal is Century 21 All-Stars or your office that you work for. Interpreter translator fluently speaks, reads, and writes English. Interpreter translator fluently speaks, reads, and writes whatever their native language is. Okay. Interpreter translator is informed by principal that principal is fluent in language too, but not fluent in English. And principal prefers information related to real estate transaction to be interpreted, translated from English to language number two. Interpreter translator is at least 18 years old. Interpreter translator is or is not being paid for the service. If paid for service, who's paying for it? Interpreter translator is, if applicable, is certified registered as an interpreter translator by the state of California or local government or California court. They don't have to be. That's fine. If certified or registered, interpreter translator has the following certification or registration number. Don't need that. Interpreter translator is or is not related by blood or marriage to principal, right? We said it could be a family member, friend, anybody that they want. If related by blood or marriage, how? Describe how, if, if at all, interpreter translator knows principal or broker, so know what their relationship is, what their responsibility is. Interpreter translator will interpret, translate all events related to the real estate transaction by and between principal and broker and by and among principal, broker, and any other broker or party and others involved in the real estate transaction included but not limited to lenders, inspectors, and title and escrow personnel. Items may require interpretation or translation in connection with the real estate transaction include but are not limited to discussions, contracts, disclosures, documents, title reports, loan documents, letters, and addenda. Okay. Broker is entitled to and shall rely solely on the interpretation of the interpreter translator with regard to all communication involving principal. Broker shall not rely on verbal or written statements by principal that have not been interpreted, translated, principal agrees, uh, principal agrees to not to hold broker responsible for improper interpretation translation on which broker reasonably rely, relied. Uh, principal shall be solely on the interpreter translator of interpreter translator for all communication involving broker. Principal should not rely on the verbal or written statements by broker that have not been interpreted or translated. Here we're acknowledging it, the interpreter translator, the principal, the broker, everybody. Now, I'm not... What this says is that that interpreter translator has to be involved in everything you do, which means the emails have to run through them, all that has to do. I know that the chances are you guys are probably not going to do that. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying I know you're not going to do that. But at least, at least you should have this form as part of your transaction and probably in any, any communications email-wise, CC this person and make sure that they're reading it. But as long as they're there for the contract and you have it and they're there for any of the documents that they sign that are in English that they can't read, because I know that you guys can communicate in your emails in their native language, right? You can write them an email in that, in, in, in Spanish or Taglo or, 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 you know, Cantonese or whatever it is, you do it. You could do that. But I would suggest that everything is, is done with at least that translator as a copy, as a CC on any communications. OK, um, we don't do it at all. Most of us, I would suggest I would suspect that if uh, the majority of agents out there in the world of real estate that speak language number two, as referenced in this form, do everything in language number two and their and their buyers and sellers sign it and everything goes on. And 99 percent of those transactions go swimmingly. Right. There isn't an issue because of that language barrier. But I, I don't want you guys to be the guinea pig. So again, I'm just letting you know that this is the way we're supposed to do it when we're dealing with someone who is not fluent in English. 
um, how you choose to do that with your business I, is is completely up to you. But I just need you to know that this is the proper way for us to deal with those transactions where we have somebody who is not a fluent English speaker. Okay. All right. Any questions before I let you guys go? <clears throat> Darwin, go ahead. Boss, let's mm -hmm. say I go to a list and presentation. I ask uh, Mr. or Mrs. Seller. Uh, do you for in, in English? They say no, but mm -hmm. you can explain. Me. I say okay, perfect. Do you have somebody that can be here? They say no. I don't trust nobody. I don't want nobody to know my business. What will you do in that case? Because it happens to me once in IAS, the lady and she say no. I don't trust even my sons, my family, nobody. And okay. I don't want nobody to know my business. I say perfect. And I went willingly as a professional. Never thought that something gonna happen, but. Saying that, how do you can do that next time? Well, I think I think it's it's got to be part of your prequal, right? The prequalifications that you do with the sellers, you've got to say. By the way, if and especially look, if my complete interaction with that client, like in your case, Darwin, is in Spanish, never right. speak English to them. The first thing I'm going to do is when I come see you, I need someone who's 18. That's whether it's your family or friend or whatever. I need them in the room with us. You don't need to trust them because I'm going to explain it to them. I just need them to verify that what I'm saying to you is what's on the paper. That's it. You don't. They're not going to explain anything to you. They're not going to carry anything. I just need them. When I'm going to explain everything to you in Spanish, I just need that person in that room at that moment to say, yes, that's what's on the contract. That's it. That's all I need is their signature. I need them in the room. And I need their signature. And, and the thing is, is that, again, I know, like I said to you guys, you're going to choose as a business choice whether or not you're going to be 100% steadfast on I use this and, and that's it. And if you don't want to sign it or have an interpreter, I'm not going to do it. That's your choice. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying that at least you've got to try. And then you got to make the decision. If that seller says, no, 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 I don't want anybody else involved. If you, if it can't be me and you forget it, then you've got to make that business choice on whether or not you feel comfortable going forward with it. Look, most of you guys are doing it now anyway. You're not using this form. So all I'm saying is this is, I have, I, my job is for everybody that's listening to these videos and is on this class right now is my job is to tell you this is the right way. How you choose to run your business is totally your choice. But this is what you should do. So that's really a coin flip, man. You got to know that relationship that you have with that potential client on whether or not you feel comfortable and confident that if there isn't somebody in the room that they're not going to use it to turn on you. That's it. But most of you guys do that now. That's how most of 99% of you have never even looked at this form and are still doing your presentations in their native language and, and having them sign an English contract. You're doing it now. And I'm not, even, I'm not even putting it out there to say, ooh, you guys are going to get in trouble. That's not what I'm saying. I just want you guys to be aware that, you know, there are some things that you can do to better protect yourself going forward than what we're doing already. But you guys are professionals. You're good at what you do. And so you're always going to do the right thing by your people. And I'm not worried about that. But I got to tell you what the, what the deal is. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right, guys, thank you for a great 2023. You've been um, terrific coming to all my classes and watching my videos on YouTube and things like that. So I, I really appreciate it. We're not going to have any more very specific contract classes now until the new year. We're going to, I'm going to be, you know, cutting off those, these one hour classes. I probably will be placing some stuff up on, on YouTube that you guys can see just little short videos about information and things that are happening. Um, but as far as these hour long classes, this is it until January. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Take care of yourself. If I don't talk to any of you or see you, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and Happy Holidays to those of you who don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, for your time spent with me. I appreciate it. Now go out there, be safe, productive, and happy for the holidays. Mm -hmm.